and welcome to Wellbeing at Work. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, which is funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund under their Business Support Programme. I'm Sarah Murray. I'm the Project Manager on the Heritage Alliance's Rebuilding Heritage Programme. This is the second of our events themed as Finding Time. We're here today to explore whether well-being in the workplace is nice to have or necessary to have. We're here to discuss if there's a business case to be made for well-being and also to support you, the heritage sector, to implement good working practices. The partner session to this is running the same time next week. So that's Thursday the 28th of January at 1.30 and running until 3 p.m. next week. And that's the Wellbeing Gym, which will guide you through practical well-being exercises. Bookings are now open, so please do visit our website and book onto next week's session. A little bit of housekeeping for you before we begin. Audience members, your cameras and microphones will be switched off throughout. Today's session will be an in-conversation style event and the questions that I'll be asking Steve, our trainer, have come from those that you submitted when you signed up. And there will be an opportunity for questions, live questions at the end, so please do add questions to the Q&A box. We, from experience of running the webinars on this series, we won't be able to get to every single question, so we'll be selecting those that are the most relevant to um, the audience in attendance today. Um, and we'll try and get to as many as we possibly can. The chat is switched on, so please do interact with your fellow attendees and let us know about any tech issues. And we do have live captioning available today, so you can switch that on via your Zoom menu. We are recording today's session and we'll be making it available on our website afterwards. I just want to share a little bit with you about the Rebuilding Heritage Programme before we begin. Rebuilding Heritage provides training and support for the sector to help heritage professionals and heritage organisations respond to the challenges of COVID-19. We're offering free resources such as today's session, which will be openly available online, but we also have one-to-one -one and group support, which is available by application. We are currently open for round three applications and you have to get your applications into us by 11pm on Thursday, sorry, beg your pardon, Tuesday, the 2nd of February 2021. Full details are available on our website at www.rebuildingheritage.org.uk. The application is quite short, we think it takes about 20 to 30 minutes to complete and you can express an interest in just one, some or all types of support that are available. For full details of the support available please do visit our website but just to give you a quick summary we have consultancy available in business planning, media and communications and fundraising and for the first time on this programme we are offering legal support in round three and we also have some training opportunities. We've got rebuilding leadership and linked to today's session managing well-being so if you are interested in any of those types of support please please do apply to us by 11 p.m on tuesday the 2nd of february 2021 now on to the session itself i am delighted to introduce you to steve wood who is a well-being and resilience coach who has worked in organizational resilience improvement for the last 25 years so has some really interesting insights on how personal resilience and organisational resilience interact. So thank you very much for being with us today, Steve. And could you perhaps mm -hmm. tell people a little bit more about the work that you do? Uh, yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, well, thank you all for coming today. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sarah, you said 25 years. That can't be right, surely. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me sound very old, um, but it must be. Or I started very, very, very young. Um, so yes, I've been working as a um, well-being and resilience both organizational resilience and individual personal resilience specialist now uh, for around 25 years it has to be said though that um initially i just simply worked on organizational improvement and resilience i did lots and lots and lots of research and lots of study and lots of reflection on my own um, sort of ups and downs in relation to personal well-being and, and mental health and did lots of work with individuals outside of the corporate environment. But up until around 2014-15, um, it was very hard to do organization, to do personal well-being and resilience work with organizations. People looked at me a little bit strangely when I used to speak about that. Um, but things changed. Things started to change in around 2015. And so since then, I've been able to do lots and lots of well-being, personal well-being and personal and organizational resilience work within organizations. I'll talk a little bit about why maybe things might have changed around that time. I do a lot of work um, in lots of different sectors, 
I love I love the heritage sector. I have to say, I love working in the heritage sector. I love you people, the passion that you got for your work, the commitment that you've got for your work. It makes this sort of um, work that I do. It makes it worth doing. It comes with challenges, and maybe it comes with challenges relating to well-being. Actually, your passion and your commitment to what you do and your love of of what you're trying to achieve through your work does come with some challenges. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll touch on that later. So I'm just I'm just going to kick off with a, a question here because something I think perhaps we're all we, we're using the word well well-being today. It's in the title of our webinar. Shall we start with the absolute basic of what are we talking about? What is well-being? Good question. Because um, it's a contested subject. It's spoken about a lot in different ways. Different people have got different views on it. There's lots written about it. Um, from a, both a psychological, physiological, and even a philosophical perspective. Let me, if I could just share my screen, there's, I put together a little bit of a composite um, definition. Um, can, can you see that, Sarah? That, yeah. So personal well-being, this is a, a, a really a composite definition, which brings together all the various different definitions. It's a dynamic state, and, and by state we mean a psychological and a physical and an emotional state in which we feel good, are able to harness and grow our potential, build strong relationships with others and, and achieve positive things for ourselves, our families, our communities and wider society. So it's not just about the absence of illness or the absence of, 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 of health, it's more than that. It's a state in which we are able to achieve some great things and work with other people. There's actually 10 characteristics um, in well-being. Um, the first characteristics, 10 characteristics rather of excellent well-being. The first is that our basic needs are met. Secondly, that we're physically fit for purpose. Thirdly, that we feel satisfied and excited about our lives. Fourthly, that we feel good about ourselves. Fifthly, a really interesting one, um, that we trust our institutions and the information they provide. It's an important element of well-being, so trust in the institutions. Sixthly, that we continually develop. Seventhly, that we live well with others and have a sense of belonging. And, and lastly, that we respond well to life's challenges, which is resilience, of course. I, I want to say though at this stage that I'm not claiming to be, to have fantastic well-being. I'm not claiming to be somebody that meets all of these characteristics and is brilliant at it. That's not really why I'm here. I'm a fellow traveler like the rest of you. My well-being goes up and down. I, I've had some pretty low points in terms of well-being and in terms of mental health. And, and, um, and uh, I've spoken to lots and lots and lots of people who have had the same. So I'm a fellow traveler. I'm just here because I can sh share um, some of those experiences. I've done lots of research in it and, and help you really to, to just take stock of what's happening both with yourself and in your organization. Um, and uh, you know, hopefully in doing that, we can sort of refine. There's very little I can teach you about well-being because you probably sort of already know it deep down, but maybe I can help you share some experiences that myself and other people and, and that you've all had, and that will help you to take stock. I just, I'm just i gonna start by commending your uh, commitment there to, to say seventhly. Um, <laughs> as you went through yeah, the list. It's not really a word, is it, <laughs> seventhly? I was gonna say eighthly, but then I thought that would sound ridiculous. I like it. And um, so you, we, we've talked a bit about then kind of what is well-being. Are there any kind of specific well-being things with regards to heritage professionals in, in your experience that you've come across that you think it's worth us keeping an eye out? Uh, um, I, d I don't want to sound critical. I love, uh, I love the, um, the sector and, and the work that you do um, and the passion that you have. That passion and that intensity and I don't mean to be rude, but that intensity and that passion can sometimes lend itself to well-being challenges. It can lend itself to perfectionism. One of, one of the things that I've um, experienced a lot when working with the heritage sector is perfectionism. And perfectionism being the enemy, really, of, of well-being. It's actually the enemy of excellence. And I've got real empathy with it because it's, I've really been challenged with perfectionism myself. 
for perfectionism, working in a very intense way, tending when you're working on things to forget about all sorts of other things, to forget about looking after yourself, because well-being really is just about looking after yourself and looking after people around you. But forgetting about exercise, forgetting about diet, forgetting about, you know, what the amount of hours you're working, going, you know, going to sleep at the right time. All of this is exacerbated a little bit. No, not a little bit. It's exacerbated a lot by COVID-19. And um, so it's the passion and the intensity that your sector shows um, is brilliant. It can at the same time lead to some well-being challenges. I mean, the other challenge is constantly working on short-term funded projects, which tend to tend to create uncertainty, which itself leads to well-being. So you've got some additional challenges and I can empathize with them because, you know, they're challenges that I've faced myself. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I, I, I can only speak from my personal experience. I don't think, um, I, I certainly don't take offence at um, heritage professionals being characterised as perfectionists and <laughs> passionate because you're right, there's, there's some really positive things about that, but I think you're also right that it lends itself to mm. some, some kind of poor wellbeing practices. And because we're talking about wellbeing in the workplace, um, could we perhaps touch on, you know, why should organisations be thinking about wellbeing for their staff and volunteers? Is, is it necessary? I have to say it really it angers me the question annoys I don't um don't take this the wrong way Sarah the question annoys me what, of, of course we should be thinking about well-being in the workplace why shouldn't we because well-being is just about being kind being kinder to ourselves and being kind to people around us and we're human beings so surely we should be kind to ourselves and kind to other people it's ridiculous that we're even having to ask the question you know, I come at this, as I just said, up until 2014, the work that I did was mostly organizational improvement. I come at this from an organizational improvement perspective. And, you know, it's, it's sort of a little bit obvious, really, that we should be focusing on this. Um, if there's one thing that shortly COVID-19 has taught us, and that is that we've got to be kinder, kinder to ourselves, kinder to people around us. And so the answer is, of course, we should be working on wellbeing. I mean, and what else is an one of the things that an organization is for? is to create an environment in which people can flourish and that people in which people can be healthy and which helps people to develop and that's one of the raison d'etre of organizations one of the reasons organizations exist so so yes definitely of course i'm gonna i'm gonna annoy you even more steve because i'm gonna i'm gonna push back a bit further on this so um of course well-being absolutely we should be being kinder to each other but in terms of organisations, what, what, what sort of evidence and data is there that backs it, this up? Because okay. us all being kinder to each other, yeah, that's, a, that's an absolutely admirable aim. But how do you justify this at an organisational level? Well, I mean, firstly, organisations that are really successful in the long term are resilient. Resilience is about dealing with challenges and being able to respond to challenges. Um, and being able to respond to challenges in a way that makes you better than you were before. And so, and well-being is a key factor in personal resilience. And so if, an, if we want an organization to be resilient, then we have to have resilient people. So in the long term, that makes us more, more effective. But I'm, I'm sort of guessing you aren't facts, do you? Do you want data? If you, if you have some data to help us okay. back this up, Steve, that'd be marvelous. Let me just bear with me, bear with me. Um, bear with me a sec. Um, Okay, I do have data. You'll be pleased to know. Um, but the first thing I guess to, to say is um, that is the mental health and well-being. Let's not confuse low well-being with mental ill health. They are two different things. Um, mental ill health uh, are is um, where your psychological and emotional state causes real challenges which could be harmful in the long term to you and to people around you and they're clinically di diagnosable just because you have low well-being doesn't mean to say that you have poor mental health lots of people with mental ill health conditions have quite quite good levels of well-being in some areas that said low levels of well-being can trigger mental ill health and so what we want to to do is to come up with some support which benefits both mental ill health and well-being. Now with that in mind we need to remember that 
around 70 million working days are lost every year because of mental ill health. 70 million. Costing Britain between 70 billion and 100 billion. Um, depression, stress and anxiety um, are um, amount to 57% of all working days lost due to ill health which is much more than, well, it's 57%. So obviously it's bigger than all the other causes put together. It's, uh, the HSC um, f believe that over 10.4, well, their research says that over 10.4 million working days are lost each year due to work-related stress. Nearly half a million people in the UK believe that they have work-related stress as a level that's making them ill. But just one or two other points before we move on um, from the data, because all, we'll send this data out to you um, so that you can use this to advocate for um, support for well, good positive well-being and mental ill health. Um, so in, in about 2015, Bupa um, and YouGov produced some research around 6,000 employers, which said that around half the managers surveyed felt constantly worried and four in 10 had experienced depression because of being, because of being stressed. Um, one in five middle managers felt stressed for more than a year and one in 10 felt close to breaking point. And also, one in five people take a day off due to stress. One in five people, yet 90% feel unable to be honest about this. Um, and, and for good reason as well, because 94%, again, in the same Booper poll, 94% of business leaders admitted to being prejudiced against people with mental health challenges in their organisation. Um, so mental ill health and a lack of well-being amounts to a significant amount of absenteeism, but also it amounts to a sig significant amount of presenteeism. So presenteeism is when you're at work, but you're not well enough to work very well. And presente presenteeism accounts for about 1.5 times more losses in productivity than absenteeism. So um, the fact that, well, the figures are clear. Yeah, that it's, there's a there's a significant business case in terms of people being at work, being able to work, um, and really, unless we look after people's well-being and mental health, then that productivity is dramatically. Mm -hmm. I just want to reiterate before we do move on. As Steve said, we will be sharing this data. This will be available on the web site so that when you are advocating for well-being in the workplace you will have these stats um, in your arsenal to kind of to go to your senior managers yeah. and explain so steve just moving us on so um you mentioned at the beginning about kind of obviously covid has um had an impact on all of this and we would be remiss to ignore the situation that yeah. we're all living through at the moment yeah. so how yeah. has covid impacted um workplace well-being yeah well covid is having a a significant effect on our well-being and and triggering and worsening mental ill health conditions um i mean obviously it goes without saying that the most profound impact of the virus is you know severe and long-term illness um and the grief that goes with that um but there's lots of different pieces of research emerging which shows that covid19 and and the resulting restrictions on our lives are affecting our well-being in other ways um so for example, um, and again, we'll, we'll send you these afterwards these ways, but I'm sure you'll be, you know, you, you, these will resonate with you. So increased levels of anxiety in general, we've seen anxiety rise significantly, anxiety levels about illness, about family, friends, about work, about money. Um, isolation, we know that isolation is having significant potential impact. I'm guessing that one of the reasons that uh, many of you have signed in today, apart from the fact that you wanted to listen to us, um, you're able to do this because you're working from home, either furloughed or, or maybe, or, or simply working from home. And, and the isolation this causes, causes can cause significant wellbeing challenges. We know that um, people's sleep has been disrupted, um, partly caused by the anxiety. We know also, and uh, just reflect on this yourself a little bit, we know that, that working from home or being furloughed causes overeating particularly food containing refined cane sugar. So we know that people snack more on sugar. Alcohol consumption has gone up caused by, you know, boredom and anxiety and simply by being close to the sugar and the alcohol. Um, less rest, relax, less rest and relaxation because our homes have become places of work and schools instead of being places of rest. Lack of regular movement. 
um, you know, when you have to get up and go into work, you, mean you tend to walk around the office, you tend to, um, you know, then you, you move on the way back. Um, we know that bit working from home has increased lack of regular movement, um, lack of variety in our physical surroundings. You know, when you go into work, there's a bit of variety there. You're seeing different people, you're seeing people on the way in, you're having a little bit of a chat with people, you know, on the way in, you're, you're seeing people move around. But the lack of variety in our physical surroundings and the practical limitations um, to our leisure time activity affect our mood and, and uh, can in enhance anxiety. Missing daily structure is another one. So this is one that I think relates to the anxiety, to the, sorry, to the anxiety sector. So the heritage sector, missing daily structure um, because of the use of home in, in, um, exacerbates the reduced ability to switch off from work. Um, and, and, you know, there's also the lack of workplace peer support, limited options for taking a break um, from your normal surroundings and daily routines, and then uncertainty about the near and long-term future. So all of those things are exacerbating well-being and mental ill health challenges. Yeah, and I think it's in, I, I'm particularly interested in the, the one you were saying about the kind of, um, you know, that your home becoming your, your kind of your whole world. And I think particularly for yeah. some of our colleagues in the heritage sector where a huge part of your working life is about the heritage site or the collections or, um, you know, the, the, the heritage that you're working with, the communities that you're working with. So I think it, it does have that additional isolating effect for us because our jobs are about places and people. Um, and suddenly it's about, you know being in a room with a screen or being yeah. furloughed and that's that's a that's yeah. a having a huge impact yeah i mean we have underestimated in, including you know people like myself who specialize in this area we have underestimated the effect that sitting at home somewhere looking at a screen for large periods of time actually has on people and i think we partly underestimated that because that is sort of my you know i've been doing that i've been working in that way for a long time um but we've underestimated the effect that um, not going out has upon people, not actually going out of their house, not actually getting into a car or getting in a train or getting onto a bus or walking somewhere and not being in a place where they can interact informally with other people. You know, you might be in, I, I, speaking to people working at the National Archives, I know um, people were saying they absolutely miss just saying hello to the person on the front desk, just walking in, you know, saying hello to the people that they pass, just um, just actually having casual chats with people, but also the lack of variety in our environment has affected us. Because not only do we tend to, uh, you know, we live in this, we might just get up in the morning, walk a few paces, go to the next room. We might not even go to the next room. We might simply carry on working from wherever we've got up um, or wherever we've been having our breakfast it means that we have a, a lack of variety in our environment and that is having a, a negative effect on us mentally, emotionally and physically. But the isolation is probably the biggest factor here. The fact that we're not in contact with many other people, except in this very unusual way where, you know, I'm sort of talking to a dot, really. I mean, I can yeah. see your face in the corner of my eye, but I'm sort of talking to a green dot in a camera and it's sort of quite an unnatural thing for humans to do. So Obviously, that, that's kind of a, a whistle-stop tour through kind of what well-being yep. is and um, how COVID has impacted it. Um, we'll have some opportunities to think about kind of um, some of the some of the questions people have submitted. But before we move on to that, I just want to say, what what can people be doing, Steve? Mm. Positive actions that they can be taking. Yeah. Well, I mean, firstly, we are all responsible, aren't we, for our own well-being, and you know, we all have we all have ups and downs in terms of well-being. Um, so we all go through times when well-being is uh, is a bit low. We all go through times when our well-being is better, and that can change. You know, on a daily basis, we're all responsible for trying to refine our well-being, um, and also we're all responsible for supporting other people to maintain their well-being. And actually. What's interesting and what it confuses me when organizations say that they, you know, aren't really able to support, it's not really their role to support, you know, well-being in the workforce, because it actually doesn't take very much time or money, particularly. Um, so, you know, to look after your well-being just involves you 
um, creating a, a good structure to your day, making sure that you keep your lifestyle balanced, doing some, ex doing some exercises to make sure that you keep yourself physically and psychologically and emotionally uh, fit for purpose and, and relaxed, trying to, um, you know, making sure that you're able to use some techniques to switch off. Now, all of those things um, don't take very much time. There are some, it's a little bit of sharpening the saw. So firstly, it's a little bit of self-awareness. You have to be aware when things are drifting. And hopefully one of the things that we're doing through this webinar and through the Wellbeing Gym next week, for example, is getting people to think, yeah, actually I, can f I, I know that things are going slightly out of balance. I can feel it. I can feel that things aren't quite right with me now. Let's actually intervene now. So firstly, it takes a little bit of self-awareness. And then it takes a commitment. It takes a commitment to wanting to, uh, to, to change something that you're doing so that you can enhance your well-being and put your well-being back to, to where it was. And then it just takes a little bit of knowledge about a few little, a few little techniques, but they're all simple techniques. And we're going to pass on as many of those techniques in the well-being gyms and on the website. I'm hoping that through you know, the Rebuilding Heritage Program, we can pass on as many of those tools and techniques as others. So we are all responsible for looking after our own well-being. And it doesn't take much, doesn't, you don't have to learn a lot because we sort of know deep down doesn't take much time. It takes a bit of sharpening the saw and it takes a little bit of practicing some techniques. Oh, sorry, so, no, you carry on. Sir. I was going to interject because because obviously that the that is um, those are brilliant sort of personal steps that people can take. But when we're thinking about workplace well-being, one of the questions that came into us a lot in advance was how do people advocate for this at work? How do people make um, mm. the case to senior managers and leaders? And we we we've been gathering examples from people and talking to our colleagues in the sector. And there's lots of examples of being told, you know, make sure you take your lunch break, make mm. sure you, you're having time away from the screen. Oh, but do this, do this one more thing for me today. Oh, no, I need, I need this by nine o'clock tomorrow morning, but do make sure you're taking a your lunch break. So how do we, how do we break those habits? Yeah. 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 Because I just wanted, before I answer that, I just wanted to add to what you were saying. We see this a lot in organizations. We see organizations, we see leaders saying that they are going to support people's well-being and their resilience. And then, in the same breath saying here's a load of here's a load more work that you've got to do uh, or for example we see pe we i lots of people say to me you know the, the the my line managers are saying to me make sure make sure you you know you've got a good lifestyle balance here make sure you've got a good balance so don't stay at work too long and then when they get up to go you know they get up to leave at half past five six o'clock um there would be a rolling of eyes going on. You know, they would walk past them, a manager, and their eyes would roll. And, and even there would be a few little snarky comments. I have to say, this really annoys me saying, you know, going already? Little, just joking. Those go, going already. But that, those jokes, you know, remain in your subconscious. Or people saying, you know, going so soon. Um, or um, people setting, I mean, I, you know, I used to work for a consultancy organization that regularly used to say to me, um, you know, you're working too many hours. Steve, they say you're working too many hours. We're not happy about this. You're working too many hours. It's really going to affect you. You've got to drive. You're not sleeping properly. We can see you're tired. And then in another breath, they would say it's important for you to hit your 80% occupancy targets, which means that I had to be with clients fee earning for 80% of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no possible way I could have done that. So you're absolutely right. What we need is we need not only are we responsible for ourselves, we are responsible for the people that we lead in organizations. Um, and I'm sort of guessing that I'm talking to an audience that's going to accept that because otherwise you probably wouldn't be here at this webinar. But it's just worth remembering that you are, you have a responsibility as a human being and as a good leader to, to support your team members with their well-being and to make sure that your actions and what you say is congruent with good well-being. But that wasn't your question, I know, Sarah. Your question no, was what about being... <laughs> it's, it's the advocating. I think, I suppose, so somebody's just put in the chat, which I just wanted to pick up on, is that is the, if we, leaders, lead by example, um, that, you know, it's, it's a kind of, everybody should be doing this. And, and if everybody makes the personal commitment, you do then 
you, you do then end up with a kind of a sort of organizational commitment to it. But the question is sort of what do you do when you're not getting that buy in at senior level for real well being mm. changes within an organization? Mm. I think. I think people are wanting to know how, how do they how do they sell this to their managers? <laughs> yeah, well, and it's you know it's uh, welcome to my world. This is uh, the world that I spend most of my time in. Um, the first thing, well, there's the data. Firstly, the data that we mentioned earlier. What I mentioned earlier that up until 2014, I did lots of um, work around well-being with individuals but I wasn't really able to do very much in organizations. And that changed around 2014, 2015 because of data, because of the data that emerged really, and that has emerged on a regular basis in 2014, 15. So some of that data I mentioned to you earlier, I mean, we, we now know that stress and anxiety um, and depression, that's both in a clinical sense and in a well-being sense, which are two slightly different things, account for more absenteeism than any other can any other condition put together it used to be muscular skeletal disorders so the data is creates a business case and that has definitely affected um, the way that senior managers would think um, so take the opportunity to use the data as an advocacy tool but also again this is a very slightly bizarre conversation because we're almost talking as if poor well-being and mental ill health don't affect senior managers. We're almost talking as if it only affects, you know, the workers. Well, that's not true at all. I mean, firstly, we all go through ups and downs in terms of well-being. And as I say, I'm a I'm a fellow traveller here, um, and you know, my well-being has dipped significantly. And you know, I I remember the day when I was in my office uh, just outside of Cheltenham when I was working um, for an organization as a trainer, as a consultant, and, the, and I was working on something for, the, um, for, a, uh, for a client the next day. And like a lot, many of you listening, I was completely absorbed into what I was doing. You know, I was, I'm a perfectionist, I was absorbed into what I was doing. And the clock struck outside, the town clock struck, and it struck four, and it wasn't four, p.m. it was 4 a.m. it was 4 a.m. now I still had to get back to my house in Swindon and then to drive to Swindon station and to get into London for a nine o'clock meeting but I wasn't thinking this is terrible in terms of my health and well-being I was thinking I was thinking I'm not going to be able to catch the train in time because I've still got another two or three hours of work to do so we've all go through major dips in well-being and also mental ill health so clinically defined mental ill health um, is no, you know, we, we are all likely at some stage in our life to be prone to mental ill health. One in four people will suffer a clinically diagnosable mental ill health condition at some time in their life. It doesn't matter how fit you are. It doesn't matter, um, you know, it doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how mentally tough you are doesn't even matter how good your well-being is doesn't matter how many how much you go out running that we are all prone potentially to me clinically diagnosable mental ill health challenges i'm a really good example of that i'm an absolutely good example of that i never thought mental ill health would affect me never thought you know i was a i've been an athlete you know i've been i've been running i've been training um you know i i thought it would never affect me but it did so the point we're saying is that one of the reasons why senior leaders need to be role models is for themselves <laughs> because it could well affect them because it affects everyone. I mean, it is no, uh, you know, it, is, it doesn't take into consideration uh, gender, position in organizations, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're middle class or whether you're not middle class, whether you're fit or whether you're not fit. So it's important for them as well. Mm. So can I also bring in a question? So because obviously when we're talking about organisational resilience, that one of the things that people are going to be looking at is budgets. What are the cost implications for an organisation implementing well-being practices for their staff? Well, that's that is really what confuses me sometimes about it, because the cost implications are negligible. There isn't really a you know, there's a cost to this. There's a cost of not doing it. The cost of not doing it is significant. 
I mean, you know, what, what, was, the, what was the figure that I came up with earlier? Um, uh, let me just come up with that figure again, because it's really, it's really important. I'm going to come up with that figure. So I'm just going to come up with a figure. So there we go. I found it. So, mental ill health and lack of well-being cost Britain between 70 billion and 100 billion each year. Yeah. Each year. So we've got a. I mean, that's. I'm going to. I'm going to push you here, Steve. What's What's the cost of actually implementing well-being for an organisation? Well, Are there costs involved? Yeah, yeah. No, you're right to push. The cost is not. It's a cost of time. This is only about time. It's about firstly having a commitment first thing you can do is have a genuine commitment to making sure that you really want to create an organization in which people look after themselves in which people are kinder to each other and in which people are kinder to themselves and in which people look after themselves and in which people look after each other a genuine commitment now that doesn't cost anything that's just that's a commitment and then making sure that the management system that you set up making sure that um, everything that you say making sure that the style of the leaders is congruent with that. So that's just a commitment, that, there's no cost to that. In terms of um, taking time to support people um, with their well-being, well, that's just a little bit of time. Now, it could be considered extra time. So for example, one of the things that we encourage in organizations that we're going to, uh, we're going to teach people to do this on one of the training sessions later on is wellness action planning which is a brilliant tool which has been developed by, by Mind. You can find out about it on the Mind website. I'll send you a link to, to it as well. But wellness action planning is brilliant. But it takes about half an hour or so to do wellness action planning with the people you, you manage. Half an hour, 45 minutes. What a fantastic use of that half an hour, 45 minutes. I know times, I know things are difficult and I know that people have lots and lots of work and they're absolutely committed, but it's just taking that time out. Um, just, just taking the time out to work on your own well-being. It might only take 10, 15 minutes or so a day, but it's absolutely worth it to do. Um, yeah, there's a few tools and techniques and ways of thinking that you might well have forgotten and that you probably knew that you might have forgotten. You might have forgotten the type of nutrition that works for you. You might have forgotten about exercise. You might have forgotten about breathing. You might have forgotten about how to be mindful. And so you might need to invest in learning some of those techniques but it's 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 next to nothing. Really. This is where I think this is where I'm going to come in with a pitch for everybody who's in attendance today to please book on to the Wellbeing Gym same time next week, 1.30 on Thursday, um, because Steve will be taking you through those really practical activities yeah. um, that help you to manage your own well-being. I am going to start taking some questions live from our audience, Steve. So um, if people, I, we've already got some in the question Q&A box, but if people would like to, um, I just as a, as a little help to me, I can't, um, the, the chat's moving quite quickly. So if you've put a question in the chat, I'm likely to miss it. So if you can please make sure you pop it into the actual, the Q&A box and you'll be doing me a massive favor. Um, so starting with a question um, where we're talking about, um, Somebody's asked about kind of trade unions and whether trade uh, unions should be playing a more um, active yeah. role in pursuing well-being and um, kind of employee manager relations. Yeah, uh, you know, that is a brilliant question. It's, it's one that makes me, um, it get, uh, gets me passionate. I've got to say I shiver when I hear that because, you know, I, I, uh, I was a trade unionist, going, trade unionist going back all those years. I personally believe that trade unions um, often are focusing on the wrong thing. Personally, we also are in a world where trade union, where the trade union movement is gradually disappearing in terms of its significance, and we shouldn't be. For me, trade unions have a massive role to play in terms of well-being. Um, the trade unions, or whatever it is we call them, I, I've done quite a lot of work in Germany, um, where it's in law, organisations over 50 people have to have an employee council. And that employee council, one of its roles is to look after well-being. Incidentally, one of its other roles is to work out what to do with company profits, which is interesting because in Germany, what they do is the employee council works to make sure that the profits are fed back into uh, staff um, workforce well-being. And it often results in people having more holidays. So you often hear, you know, large German companies, people having, I don't know, you know, 10, uh, lots and lots and lots of weeks holiday. But I believe that trade unions have a key role in terms of making sure that the balance, in terms of educating leaders, in terms of checking for that congruence, checking to make sure that what leaders say and what they do 
match up because often it's done with the best intent um so often for example leaders will be senior leaders will want will recognize and understand the importance of well-being but without knowing it things will be in place um they will put things in place or perpetuate processes which um which get in the way for example this is controversial and if there's any hr people out there please don't write into me write into sarah because uh, don't write into me personally the way appraisals are often done for me is completely wrong it's completely wrong it's completely counterproductive and adversely affects well-being um, for me and adversely affects effectiveness and adversely affects development so i think sometimes people sort of leaders say yeah we're really committed to well-being but there's performance review and appraisals and objective management by objectives and a whole range of things put in place which get in the way and they sometimes don't know trade unions have got a role i think to make sure that congruence is there to make sure that the organization is constantly in balance and is constantly working on, on well-being Pe people often say to me so i just because i know you wanted to come in people often say to me should we be working on you know the organization's performance goals or should we be working on well-being well that's a little bit like saying you know with covid19 should we be working should we be locking down you know looking after health or should we be working on productivity they are the same goals they're yeah. exactly the same goals you know what staff well-being workforce well-being including the well-being of volunteers remember workforce well-being is the so you, is the you, success of the you're leading very nicely into my next question steve because somebody was yeah. asking about are there are there particular well-being needs that organizations heritage organizations should be thinking about with regards to volunteers yeah. well yeah definitely i mean you know with many you, you don't need me to say i mean the, the volunteers are are your workforce um and in many um heritage organizations um you know it, it's it's the volunteers which are which are vastly which are the vast part of the workforce so i personally believe that we should be looking after the well-being of volunteers and volunteers should be looking after the well-being of paid people we should be looking after the well-being of each other regardless of whether people are paid or not paid there is another interesting point here and that is that the fact that volunteers exist and do so much work in many of your organizations does i've had a number of people coming back to me to say it ten, tends to lead to a, a sort of a feeling that well because volunteers are doing it for nothing and not being paid we've got to work even of even more we've got to do even more work even more than the volunteers and so that sort of perpetuates this notion that there's almost a guilt element there perpetuates the notion that you've got to work even harder even longer even more hours and I think that's something that when we've been speaking to people through the Rebuilding Heritage Programme, sometimes um, there's a dangerous kind of one-upmanship to being overworked. So it's a sort of, you know, <laughs> I worked 10 hours yesterday. Well, I worked 12 hours yesterday. And I think that it's, it's sort of, it can set a really dangerous yeah. tone within organisations yeah. where people feel yeah, the yeah, need yeah. to evidence that they are the ones going above and beyond and yeah. so if somebody else is doing it you have to you have to match or better yeah. and i think that's that yeah. and i think that's it's a very strange, what you're saying is is that is that um i have always thought of that as a classical macho environment or is that i don't know well no i was gonna say um no well i i have i have personally experienced it in heritage organizations and we've heard a lot of feedback from um mm -hmm. people participating in the webinar today and also more generally through our consultation mm -hmm. that that kind of the the expectation that you go above mm -hmm. and beyond um mm -hmm. is sort of Absolutely. set within the heritage what does sector. that mean what does above and beyond mean that's got to be one of the worst phrases that it, it's become a very well i see it on cvs all the time it's become a very well-known phrase that I go above and beyond. Above and beyond what? What does that actually mean? I've, I've, had, it, I've had it as an interview question. Yeah, I mean, I've worked in organisations where as soon as I walked in, the senior manager said, well, of course, I work 16 hours a day. Um, and so we're all in competition. We're all in competition to try and get up to, to that level. You know, there's no evidence whatsoever. I've just looked at the evidence in detail. There's no evidence that the number of hours that people work um, correlates to the impact that they're having. There's no evidence at all. It's a very curious business. We've all got used to working over the weekends. You know, we've got used to doing a bit of work on Sunday or doing lots of work on Sunday or working really late, you know, on one day. But none of us have got used to saying, well, I worked on a Sunday. Now I'm going to go to the beach or the cinema or the shops or have a lie in or, or just watch the telly or whatever on a Monday. 
you know, we got used to working on a Sunday, but we haven't got used to saying, well, I had to work on a Sunday, so I'm not going to work on a Tuesday. Um, so, but balance is not only the key, one of the keys to well-being, it's also one of the keys to effectiveness. One of the things that is interesting about my personal story is that when my well, as I say, I'm a fellow traveler, when my well-being really dipped, and this is the case with everyone, when your well-being really dips, um, it makes you much less effective at the things you were trying to achieve in the first place. The things that were making you work really long hours, you're unable to do because your well-being is really dipped. Um, and, that's, and that's leading me nicely to my next question about um, people, we've got a couple of people who've asked about when you yourself are a leader or a line manager and you are experiencing um, well-being challenges, it, it, it can be very challenging to then support your staff. Uh, so how do, you, exactly. how do you sort of turn around your own well-being yeah, at the yeah, same time yeah. that you're supporting people with their well-being? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sorry, I was, just, I was chuckling because I just saw one of, the, one of the chats about an old saying, uh, saying, look busy, fool, everyone. Um, yeah, um, no, you're absolutely right. The, the, I guess the message that I'm trying to put across is we have a responsibility firstly to ourselves, actually, because unless we can look after the well-being of ourselves, it's actually very difficult to look after the well-being of everyone else. So in, in really good organisations, and I've worked with some organisations that do this really well, then everybody is supported. So there's well-being coaches in organisations, and some, sometimes they're peer coaches. Um, so it would be not uncommon for senior managers to have coaches who were other people in the organisation. They might be peers of theirs, for example, or they might not. They might be people at different levels, or they might be external people to support their, to support their well-being. So that's not uncommon at all. Um, I just want to go back to this question about money. Because people will often say, ah, you know, so it takes a lot of time to look after our well-being, uh, to do some a well-being coaching session with some people, you know, to coach people to enhance their uh, their their lifestyle. See, personally, I would train everyone in organisations, as many people as possible, in um, well-being coaching skills and wellness action planning skills, and we're going to do a bit of that through this program. Um, but people often say, you know, it's an it's an hour out of my time. I can't afford it really an hour out of your time to sharpen the saw what about if you replace your, your, your daft appraisal meetings or your <laughs> or the, the 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 meetings where everyone just waffles and talks about tasks that they haven't really done but they pretend that they have done them what about if we replace that with a half an hour you know one-to-ones on on wellness or on lifestyle or on or on you know your own sort of broader personal development i'm sure there are ways that we can replace what we do um, what we're currently doing, tweak that so that it becomes much more valuable for well-being. I've also come across organisations that specifically allocate uh, a, 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 a time budget to well-being activity. So um, they would say, you know, everyone's got this amount of time and it's in the form of a budget, this amount of time that you spend on well-being. In the same way that organisations, some organisations would say, this is the amount of time you've got to spend on learning and development. Some will say this is the amount of time you've got to spend on, you know, on impact on society activity. This is the amount of time that we want you to spend on well-being for yourself and with other people. Yeah, and I just want to feed into that some of the other webinars that we've run on the series, where um, a, a brilliant phrase was used, where somebody said, you know, don't waste a good crisis. That if if, if you're going to make a change, kind of these are really these are good times to be making changes because stuff has changed outside of our control and when we haven't wanted it to change. So actually now is an opportunity yeah. to make really positive changes. Um, we've got a question here, speaking of a big change, <laughs> that people are feeling um, really isolated. And one of the things that um, we're really aware of on, on our program, the Rebuilding Heritage Program, is that the webinars we're offering don't, don't help people to feel less isolated because it's still looking at the screen. It's more screen time when we're all trying to get less screen time. Um, so one of the things we're going to do with the Rebuilding Heritage Program is do a bit of a refocus on trying to get some more group activities. I'm afraid it will still be screen time. We will still mm. be doing it via Zoom. Mm. But at least it's bringing people into a room together. Have you got any other kind of um, tips for people about how to to, how to kind of challenge those feelings of isolation when you can't yeah. physically able, yeah, not yeah. able to interact and virtual hangouts just aren't the same no they're not the same and I, i've been surprised at this actually i've been surprised at quite how much people have been affected i actually had always assumed that um, virtual communication would 
meet this need for interaction, but it doesn't seem to. Yeah, I mean, I miss it. I have to say, I miss that I used to be let out once a week to go and do face-to-face -face workshops with people, and I, I miss that um, or face-to-face -face coaching. But I, but you know, this this complete isolation. We're not in complete isolation now, of course. As you know, and we have to remember that as as we go out and about, you know, we can still chat to people, keeping our distance. Um, and this is not going to last. There's going to we're going to end up in a hybrid world. We're going to end up in a hybrid world. We're not going to go back, I don't think, to the world we're in, and, and that's okay. We're going to end up in a world where we can make use of virtual communication. But I encourage all organisations to, as soon as they can, to open up in a safe way so that people can come in maybe one day a week, two days a week, and uh, uh, you know, just one day a week would make a difference. But until then, one of the things that we do a lot of work on is encouraging people just to get out, just to make sure that they are actually programming times in their day when they're getting out and about, and you're walking, and, and particularly walking, if you can, um, you know, you're out and about, you're walking, just seeing people and just acknowledging people, saying hello to people, passing the time as you, as you go past them, um, then I think it makes a massive difference. One of the things we do with people is get them to uh, come into work as if they're coming into work normally. So get up in the morning, get dressed as if they're going to work, you know, have breakfast, have a shower, do whatever you need to do, get dressed as if you're going to work. Um, and you wouldn't believe how nice I smell now because, you know, I've done, you know, get dressed as if you're going into work, then go out of the house, walk around, acknowledge people, say hello to people, go, you know, go into the shops, whatever, buy something, say hello to people, just interact with people and then come back in and come into work as if you're coming into work normally. Um, so I, I think that um, if we can engineer as much interaction, as much three-dimensional proper human interaction with people, even if it's very brief, then I think it's absolutely key. Yeah. Um, and um, we've got a question here about the, uh, again, the questions um, that we're seeing a lot of is it's, there are a lot of questions about kind of advocating to managers. Yeah. Um, and with, and the question here about sort of people who might struggle to be assertive in this space, because yeah. there, there feels a, a kind of a concern about saying, I am worried about my well-being and I need to do something, something has to change. Mm. And I think there's, as you said about the kind of, in, when you were presenting us with the statistics, there's a, there's a concern about talking about well-being and mental health mm. in the workplace. Mm. So what advice would you give to somebody who is, who is struggling to have that conversation about yeah. work-life balance, being overworked, that yeah. feeling of kind of that kind of professional one-upmanship? How, how do you have that difficult conversation? Yeah. I mean, just to reiterate the statistics, it's around around 60 70 percent of us um need to take or, or really struggling with stress related challenges and that could be well-being or it could be clinical mental health and of those 70 percent around 90 percent don't feel comfortable talking about it um so i mean if that is the case then obviously there are some options to explore there are um so if you don't feel as though you can talk to a line manager talking to talking to a peer can make a difference Definitely. Some organisations, of course, seek out your occupational health teams, which can make a which can make a difference. For those who don't have um, an occupational health team, there is an organisation that's been set up. I can't offhand remember the name, but again, I will send you the link to it, which actually provides occupational health services for those organisations that don't have occupational health. So you can contact people. There's also a whole range. What we've got in uh, around the world now, which we didn't have 10 years ago, is a plethora of organisations that will provide free support um, to help with well-being and and mental ill health um, and so you know just it might only be a few minutes chat might be a five ten minutes discussion but they exist and again i'll send as many links as possible the other thing i would say can i can i just make an offer sarah at this stage and that is that if you think that let's just think about mental ill health for a second you think that one in four of us will have a clinically diagnosable mental ill health challenge during their life. That's one in four. So I'm looking at the list, there's 67 participants here. So that means there's a good, you know, there's a pretty good chance that there's, you know, 10 to 20 people out there who are sitting there thinking, actually, I am, you know, really suffering. I have some real challenges in terms of mental ill health, or I know some somebody who does. Or it might just be, it might not be clinical mental ill health challenges. It might be sort of low well-being. What I'm saying is, if you want to talk to somebody who's completely um, 
separate from your organization who could help contact me in it's an offer contact me i'm happy Steve, to that's an, to be, that's an incredible to and incredibly kind offer so um i think i think it is worth saying especially on a session like this where we are dealing with a really sensitive subject matter and obviously there, there may well be people who've joined us today because you feel like you've hit rock bottom or you feel like you really don't know what your next steps are and that is um, we will be dropping steve's contact details into the chat um so please do take steve up on that very kind of that and i'm also just going to put in a pitch here to also apply to the program managing well-being is the um is the training session that steve will be running in small groups and they will be confidential um, small group sessions so if, if this is something that you are struggling with um the the, de the next deadline is the 2nd of february 11 p.m and managing well-being is one of the support offers that you can apply for so please please do sarah can i just make one other very quick point that, that we've missed so far which is a fairly obvious point in terms of advocacy and that is that many mental health conditions can lead to um, a disability uh, as defined by the Equality Act. Therefore, um, supporting people with mental ill health and responding people in the correct way is actually ingrained in the Equalities Act, 2010 Equalities Act. So therefore, there's a legal requirement um, in terms of you know, supporting people with mental ill health in the same way as there is with any other disability. Um, the other thing is that although specific legislation for mental health first aid isn't, provision isn't yet in the workplace, the Health and Safety Executive recommends, and I'm just reading what they say because I just brought up, what, I brought up the guidance, which says you should consider ways to manage mental ill health in your workplace which are appropriate for your business, such as providing information or training for managers and employees, employing occupational health professionals, appointing mental health trained first aiders, and implementing employee support programs. That's the HSC guidance. Many organizations already have more, I'm just gonna close this down, many organizations already have more, as many mental health first aiders as they do other traditional first aiders. I'm part of a campaign group at the moment, which is embedding that into law. So, and that is, and I believe that within five years, it will be a legal requirement for organizations over a certain size to have trained mental health first aiders in the workplace. I think five years it's inevitable. I was going to say, somebody I know who has who's done uh, mental health first aider training has said that they've used it far, far more times than they have ever used their first aid at work training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's a really... Well, because, I mean, you use it almost every day. I mean, I'm a mental health first aid tutor. Um, and, you know, I get lots of feedback from people saying, well, actually, the skills we use, the techniques, the process, that we have is we've we use it every day yeah. you know with so people. we are we are very rapidly approaching the end of um our session today so i just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you all for attending and thank you all for your amazing um questions and input into this session um it is a difficult subject matter sometimes to talk about please do take steve up on his kind offer to be in touch with him if you've got any pressing needs or anything that you wanted to discuss more privately please do apply to the um, rebuilding heritage program to get onto that managing well-being training um, that will be available so this is the the deadline that's the 2nd of february and we need your applications in by 11 pm and you can also apply for the other consultancy and support offers that we've got at that time um, just as a kind of final takeaway steve are there um are there are there kind of any lasting thoughts any any actions people can take off the okay. back of today's session um to take us out for our last two minutes of can, the session? can i leave people with a challenge please do it's a challenge for everyone i'm uh you don't have to, no you have to accept this challenge you have to take it up i'm gonna i've got a list of you i'm gonna come around to your house and check um if i was allowed but i'm not so <laughs> things to the, <laughs> so this is an example of one of the things we do on the on the well-being gym. They're very short exercises. This is an example. Um, one of the difficulties that we have um, it, it, working from home, and, and actually not working from home, but one of the difficulties that we have at the current times is that we get stuck in a bit of a rut. We do the same things. We get up at the same time. We eat the same things. We come into work at the same times. We sit in the same environment. I mean, we see the same four walls every day. When we go for a walk, we go on the same walk. <sighs> My challenge to you is, over the next, no, yeah, over the next week, do something different, something different. Now, it could be just changing your daily routine. Get up a bit earlier, go out for a walk, as I say, before work, 
um, you know, just changing something about your routine, maybe go to bed a bit earlier, maybe make a conscious decision, just one thing. It could be a different type of exercise. Try a bit of yoga, try a bit of Pilates, try, um, just try and maybe go out and, I don't know, go out for a cycle, go out and do something that's completely different. Um, it could be reading something different, couldn't it? It could be um, reading a different book. It could be a different magazine. Or what about this? It could be learning something new, committing yourself to learning something new. What about um, enrolling on a course? What about learning a new skill? What about playing the piano? What about being creative, making something, doing something? Or what about finally, what about just contacting, just contacting somebody, picking up the phone, contacting somebody you haven't spoken to for years, somebody you don't normally speak to, and just do something, just one thing, just one little thing, by the inch it's a cinch, by the yard it's hard, I think it's the quote, <laughs> just something a little bit different this week. So on that note, on Steve's Freshness Challenge note, please do join us again the same time next week, 1.30 on Thursday next week for the Wellbeing Gym. And if you do join us, let us know what your Freshness Challenge was. What did you do that was new? Um, we, when, you, when you leave the webinar today, you'll get a feedback form that pops up. Please, please fill it out um, and it will be emailed to you afterwards. The consultation and the evaluation is what helped us um, to realise that well-being was something that the heritage sector wanted us to address on this programme so it really does help us to plan that future training and support um, and then um, we will hopefully see you all again this time next week for the well-being gym and thank you so much for attending today's session thank you uh, so thank, much Steve thank you very much and I'm looking at the chat and there's all sorts of people who are going out right now because the sun's coming out and they're yes, going to go out for a walk right now I can see the sun's coming out where you are Sarah Crikey, it's in your face <laughs> lovely thank you so much everybody bye-bye okay thank you